we are talking with people across the community about the great things they're doing, especially uh, when it comes to not only diversity and inclusion, but to support our communities and to support people and students um, and everyone across our um, neighborhood. So today we're talking about the great event that's gonna be at Center Church in South Hadley. Many of us are so excited to be a part of this. We're so excited to uh, learn more. Um, and, and I'm sure Lori's gonna tell us a lot more, not only about the church, but the mission of the church that has been you know, over years, but of late, some of the initiatives that they've had and, uh, you know, and they're going to host Voices of Resilience. Um, you know, I think this is just a, a perfect combination to inspire our communities. So Lori, tell us about Center Church. I'll be glad to do that. Uh, Center Church started in 1733, and that allowed the town of South Hadley to be chartered. So we've been around the block a while. Our, our church building is now a historical site, and we're proud of it, as well as we do recognize that our church sits on literally the common. And so what kind of uh, voice should we share regarding justice? In the last several years, our church has been very social justice oriented, reaching out to the community in a variety of ways. And what started, oh, and we're United Church of Christ. It's a long time denomination. Uh, roots are with the Congregational Church. Unfortunately, the roots are with the witch trial, but as well as we were the ones who gave money for the Amistad uh, uh, relief for the slaves coming over. So we have a mixture of history within our denomination. We're uh, also- in, Oh, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but just so for people who may not know, the Amistad was the ship that carried enslaved people from Africa and was brought here to Massachusetts. And I'm going by the movie now. And then <laughs> Anthony Hopkins or, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, basically here in Massachusetts, Mass, Mass, Massachusetts the, the question of enslavement was brought front and center um, because of the, the, the people on the Amistad who were seeking freedom. Yes. And so our church has always been aligned with social justice. Um, first to ordain a black man, a woman, uh, somebody who was gay, uh, the first to speak up for um, just human rights. But we align it with our spirituality as well. So after the series of deaths um, uh, of black men, um, especially by the police, um, we began to start uh, consecutive vigils on Saturday. We had been doing vigils once a month on truth, on we, uh, women's reproductive rights, the environment, and when George Floyd died, we said, we've got to do something even more so. So along with our two other uh, churches in South Hadley, we had an ecumenical vigil, which attracted 220 people. It lined from oh, just north of us where the Episcopalians were, all the way down, down the sidewalk to the end of Mount Holyoke. That's how many people had attended. Well, after that, our church members said, so what are we going to do? We can't stop with this. And so we committed ourselves, our church, to holding vigils for racial justice every Saturday. And we did it for over 80 Saturdays in a row. Didn't matter the weather. And we had... <coughs> an average of uh, 40 to 60 people. And near the end, it it may have dropped to oh, 12 or 15. Um, but then during that whole process, we would talk among ourselves, 
And I learned, um, I was a minister and community organizer in Phoenix, Arizona. And we had created five habitat homes within a year. But it was a success, but we never planned what next. Essentially, I failed. Well, I was a success. Oh, oh please don't say you failed. Can, I'd like to interject a question yeah. here. What to you was the power of these vigils? Uh, how, for the people who participated for yourself? Oh, that's an excellent question, Natalie. Natalia. Um, uh, Na Natalia. See. <laughs> thank you. No. Thank, thank you, you for correcting me, Natalia. <laughs> thank you. Um, it it was bringing community together on one issue for justice for blacks and browns and people of color. And it was positively um, expressed. And also it felt like church, a sacred space because we weren't meeting together inside our church. And it came, it brought people from Greenfield, from Springfield, um, and we were meeting new friends. So it got to be the point where, oh, it's Saturday morning. What friends are we going to meet? New friends, as well as so many cars driving by. Some people made it a point just to drive by on their way to a grocery run and honk their cars, uh, their horns. But it, it was a sacred space for important justice work to be done. I think this is, it's so powerful because just like um, the voices exhibit that will be there, it does become a space that we can share. Our communities are very, and I will say segregated in many ways. Um, our communities are disconnected in many ways. Many of us who sit in communities and do not even know our neighbors. Uh, so I, I, you know, and this point of connection um, is so important because if we don't have these spaces and even to get to know one another, uh, when we, we, we share these 50 plus voices of women, most people are like, I might've heard of this one. I never heard of the rest of them. And, and, and I really may not even understand why they are significant or important. So there is a connection to happen. And, and sometimes it's ignited by just that. This is the call and you made the call. And, um, and if more of us could do that, and just thank you, Natalia, for having us on the show, which is also um, a point of connection. Hopefully there are folks who are listening out there who are saying, you know, this is what needs to happen. This was during COVID. So we were not meeting together inside the church. It was on Zoom and <clears throat> taped Zoom or YouTube. And <clears throat> We had begun. We had begun to lose the sense of community. Mm -hmm. However, people eagerly came out on Saturday morning, despite the weather, to see friends, to meet new friends, um, to see what community looks like. Really, the spirit of God. And we had atheists. We had a fellow who came and would wave the Israeli flag. <clears throat> Some of us would kindly say <coughs> to him, um, this is a, uh, a vigil for racial justice. And as he indicated, he said the sidewalks are uh, uh, public domain. And we said, okay. And we just let him be a part of us. Um, but it, it it was uh, most moving in that even after a while, there would be a lot more non-church members attending than church members because we, we wanted to see community 
and we called our time together sacred. Uh, so what's coming up? There's an event coming up, coming up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll just begin it and then um and then Janine can finish up because she's done so much work involved with it and has been the uh, lead curator. Um, so we were asking ourselves, what next? What can we do? And I, I am always moved by art. So I thought, what about if we, we ask um, Black artists from the Pioneer Valley to come and we ask our local businesses to hang pieces, show sculpture, tapestry um, in their buildings as well as it within our church. I did ask some businesses and they did say yes. However, they would look up at the walls and say, how much wall space do we have? Not much. And so I was a little discouraged and I shared it with a very, a very strong lay leader, Anita Saro. And she said, well, I have a neighbor who they did an exhibit a year ago, Voices of Resilience. And she might have <clears throat> a say in this matter. So Janine, I turn it over to you. <laughs> yeah, so that wonderful neighbor was uh, Dr. Demetria Shabazz. Um, and uh, and I know, uh, Natalia, you know Demetria as well. And uh, for her, she said, yeah, this could be a good match. And we all started talking. And, um, and when they said they had this new space, and I said, yeah, uh, this could be a perfect place for this. And, and, um, and you know, when you put three people together who have a willing spirit, it happens. And that's what happened. We um, match some of the photos. We, every, every place that we go, uh, we take the voices. We also do research around what, who are some of the voices there that should be raised. And we just conducted the project and, um, and we have launched it on the walls. It will open on September 18th. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but it will be there until October 15th right at Center Church. Um, and maybe, Lori, you can maybe tell them where it's situated and, um, and sure. so forth. So we are in what's called the, the center of South Hadley, across from the town common and adjacent to Mount Holyoke College. Parking can be around the church on the weekends. It can include the college as well as over in the common. We're at one church street and we <clears throat> straddle church street and park street. Uh, and the building will be open on Sunday afternoons uh, around 11 o'clock to two Saturdays. I think it's um, 11 to two or three. And then on Wednesdays in the afternoon, if you have questions, please call 413-532-2262. And if somebody doesn't pick up, we will return your questions. Yeah. And why, um, este Lori, this particular exhibit, what was it that, uh, what is uh, the content of it that draws you in? <laughs> Women. Black women and their allies. Uh, I've long time been a proponent, a feminist, and recognize the beautiful power of women that can often be underutilized, unrecognized. And to be exposed to these stories of women and we, a couple of days ago, we used the phrase hidden figures. They're there in our midst, but we forget we, we or never have heard of them. And when they pop out at us in the chapel where they're exhibited, their pictures, their stories come to life. Um, 
and they're all women of resilience. I would recommend, uh, I would certainly support men of resilience, but I think there's enough going on for men of resilience. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, they pretty much rule the world. So I think it's really great that a space has been carved out them they, to recognize women. And I'm part of it. Am I still part of it? Yeah. Yes, you okay. are part of it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and, and perhaps if you can just hear a moment of your background. Well, my background is, uh, is I come from a community activist in Puerto Rico, and starting with my grandparents, my grandfather, my grandmother, bueno, even before that, my great grandfather, and, este, and my mother also. In my grandfather uh, was the first elected governor of Puerto Rico. Um, my grandmother fought for Spanish to be the language of um, education in the public schools of Puerto Rico. And for taking that stand back in the early 1930s, she was fired from her job as a teacher. And um, her, her struggle was, let's not lose ourselves because the United States has come here to take over our country. And my mother was a community activist in housing and for gay rights. So I come from I come from a from from a people who know that it's just not enough to breathe, este, and enjoy life. Um, that what are how are you making it? How are you making it better for other people? Yes. Uh, yes. And and down the line, and to have a hope that even if we don't see it in our lifetime, that's not the point. Is that somewhere down through history, we what our actions are part of a larger story, of a larger American story, in this case, in the United States. Yes, and thank you. And, um, you know, sharing these bits. Now, a, a small exhibit can't do it all, but we at least throw some names out there. We're hoping people will research and will begin to think about. Um, and uh, there are many, many, as you well, said. Well, your own people. grandmother, Janine. Yes, 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 yes. Tell us I mean, about her. Yes, the, the title of the exhibit is my grandmother, Miriam Kirkaldi, who inspired me, um, you know, to not only just in life and, and being a human being, um, she was always known as an ambassador, you know, on our block in Queens, New York, and I used to really think she was the ambassador, I didn't <laughs> really know. It was like the UN and all of this good stuff, but I, I just said, you know, she was, she was a real ambassador to others. And she came here via Ellis Island, you know, 1917, and she entered a world she didn't know. And, and she made friends. Uh, she learned a lot. And if that's what she's taught me, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and, and a lot of us, uh, you know, uh, were raised um, you know, really understanding the goodness of these wonderful mothers and grandmothers. And at some point, we'll talk about your grandmother's exhibit, um, mm -hmm. because that too is um, so powerful. But, but for my grandmother, she was truly a very, you know, um, a special, special woman. Um, and you consider, you know, I always used to, I said, I wish I could ask her, um, and I, my, I called her Nanny. That was her name, and 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 that even in that name, um, Nanny of the Maroons in Jamaica, where she was from, um, is a very historical woman. Um, and uh, and I used to think about. I said, I wish I could have asked her, how did you get on that boat? I mean, how did you, you know, it's not mm -hmm. like today where let me buy a ticket and let's just go. You know, this was a big move for a young woman. So, um, so if we can just grab an ounce of what some of these women really had, um, and, uh, you know, it would be wonderful. And how she brought that spirit, you know, to her new surroundings. And I think um, you I'd certainly like do on. have that, Janine. I think you certainly oh my do have God. that <laughs> in the work that you do and how you are in the world, for sure. Yes, and, um, and I hope people will come and experience this wonderful space at Center Church. Um, it is truly special. 
And, uh, you know, and I think, as you said, Lori, is really meeting um, people, greeting people, even if you're coming through for two minutes or you really want to take a deeper look. And, and I'm sorry, I want to make sure I am being dutifully respectful, Reverend. So, so. <laughs> Well, I, Lori, um, who are the women in your life yes. that inspired you? That along the way you thought or you felt, well, this person, whether you knew them in life or not, their life is a part of your life. I have strong women in my background. And um, one was my mom's mom and as well as my mom my mom's mom went to Simmons College she got her degree in dietitian she then went on to Columbia University to get her master's and to get her master's she was with all white um, men uh, studying to become doctors mm. she, one time she took a chemistry test and she got it perfect. And the professor said, you must have cheated. Mm, wow. Had to take it again. No surprise, right? But still shocking mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. And she got another perfect. And she was a very humble, humble person that wound up running the city of Detroit's diet, dietary um, school system wow. for a couple of years before she met my grandfather. Um, and then my mother, this is, this is, um, I think one of the proudest. Um, she went on to med school at University of Michigan. Uh, this was the first year they did their MCATs and she scored off the charts and she went to school and there was anatomy class and her, her, one of her friends named Bunny was black, is black. Bunny's still alive. And the professor showed slides of African women and made derogatory comments about their figures. Bunny got up, burst in, into tears and left. And my mother went out with her to comfort her. The male black students in the class, because of mom's response, would stop by her house where she lived and help transport the box of bones to school every day to honor my mom. My mom flunked out her first year because she got an F in anatomy she did very well, but he just arbitrarily gave her an F because he was insulted by her actions. And um, that summer was a recognizing, uh, reckoning summer of what to do and anger. And I would not have done it any other way. And she went on to go into actually uh, molecular, molecular biology. And and University of Michigan called her back and said, we want you back. And she said, no. Mm -hmm. And that story found such a deep space in my heart, in my body, in my thinking, that that propels me on. Mm -hmm. And oh. this is the power of the storytelling. Mm -hmm that moves us from within, it really it does. And I'm aware we all carry these stories, but superficially, mm -hmm. we just see, oh, whatever, a, a superficial mm -hmm. story. Yes. Right. People don't necessarily, don't, people that we work with or that we know, uh, maybe through social media or just through, you know, situations este, or events. Um, we really, yeah, we don't know necessarily all the people that inhabit that person, all the memories, the stories, 
that give them a sense of resilience. Yes, and that's what we will see in this. And there's uh, one of the other scholars on the, the project, Dr. Lucy Lewis, she is going to share her journey. Um, she's a genealogist and she has researched her own background and she has taken herself, her family dates back to many um, you know, strains in the religious area, but um, she does have some members who were in the Salem witch trials. So um, we will hear about that as well. And a lot of people may not ascribe an African-American to having that connection, but she does. So we will hear some untold and less known stories. And I think the other story, particularly regarding my my aunt is that a lot of people thought Rosa Parks was the first. And we've heard that they, there, there are many that they report in between, but, um, but my aunt is the one who actually won the Supreme Court case that became a precedent in the Rosa Parks case um, while others were cited. And uh, a lot of these people are just simply not talked about. So mm -hmm. we're just you know very blessed that we can be at Center Church um, to have this wonderful display and special thanks to Lori and everyone there. Um, and, and also I always give a shout out to my wonderful family, my husband, Tom, and my daughter. Um, and we all know um, a lot of these projects are a labor of love. And, um, and we are um, deeply committed as a family. So, and I think for us, um, you know, we will honor those voices.